If you don't mind, Linda, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask all of you the same question. Just very briefly, if there's a word or a few sentences that you could share, what do you see as the biggest challenge when it comes to DEI and leadership in corporate America right now? I think it's uh, a feeling that DEI is, uh, is scary now. All right, Michael, over to you. I, th I think the biggest opportunity is reducing the focus on it being weaponized as a topic and increasing more uh, energy around the importance of addressing underrepresentation of folks towards helping an economic uh, outcome uh, for companies. I think it's 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 easily being misinterpreted as as a, as an issue uh, when the reality is um, that we just need to stick to uh, doing what we can as organizations to help increase the development opportunities for people who are underrepresented. Ozzy, what do you see as the biggest challenge currently? No, I definitely agree with Linda and Michael. For for us, it's about the data, and I think it's being completely overblown. If you look at the data points, it really shows that there is a still commitment to DEI in the largest companies in the U.S. So we stay the course. Sid? Um, well, well, thanks, Frank. And by the way, uh, my uh, congrats to you for your leadership on Worldwide Exchange every day on CNBC. Um, and Hacer, our biggest concern uh, is that non-DEI officials are trying to tell DEI uh, cultural leaders and uh, our community how we should acculturate in our community. And that's a major significant concern. And so certainly we're gonna hear us talk about the fact that we're not gonna slow down, we're not gonna back down, we're going to double down on DEI. All right, so certainly these are being seen as very difficult times by a lot of people, especially in diverse communities. Um, there's a lot of noise out there. Michael, I wanna come over to you. How do you, you separate the noise from your, your overall mission? And I wanna apologize, it's a little noisy here right now. We're at the New York Stock Exchange where the Reddit IPO was happening behind me? Well, I mean, <clears throat> in our view, you separate the noise by, by focusing on the essence of what matters most um, as relates to diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion. You know, this assault on DEI that's being referenced doesn't really follow the facts about how diversity and inclusion has actually helped our country advance at, at the business in, in our businesses as a society over the years. And so uh, whenever one focuses on the outcomes of addressing inequities uh, for people who are underrepresented in leadership roles, um, that is more productive as it relates to how you advance the business and economic interests of organizations, which is what everybody's expecting uh, companies to do, uh, versus getting caught up in someone else's definition of whether it's valuable or not. I mean, so I think you, you, you reduce the noise by focusing on what matters the most in terms of outcomes. All right, so Sid, I know you're also focused on the data. Uh, according to your data, representation uh, for Latinos in both the boardroom and also the C-suite, it's lacking. So how do you focus on moving that mission forward to increase representation? Well, well Frank, the first uh, part to understand is that despite the uh, ruling of the Supreme Court decision last year as it relates to affirmative action for college, uh, uh, for college uh, applications, um, getting onto a board or moving up into the C-suite has nothing to do with your qualifications. It has to do with sponsorship and it has to do with your credibility. And that is very subjective. So anytime you have subjectivity, there is room for a bias. And so our major concern is that the issues that are, that are creating bias, particularly for Latinos, particularly for uh, people of color, and particularly for women of color, uh, have not gone away. And so we need to continue to stay the course and not only show the business case, but the culture case uh, that corporate America cannot succeed without an acculturation strategy that integrates and includes all of us. So DEI is not going to go away no matter what they try to do because the market is going to say you need to have a DEI multicultural strategy to succeed. So Ozzy, I know you're, you're specifically focused on the boardroom, but you're really emphasizing that you need more collaboration as opposed to confrontation. No, absolutely. 
I mean, that's why we're having this conversation today with these uh, um, great leaders and peers. You know, for us to be able to advance this work, we really need to ensure that we all inform each other of how we impact in the boardroom, in the C-suite, and other areas within business. As we've been mentioning, you know, the data speaks for itself. Uh, recent polls state that DEI is of great importance, not to the boomers, but Gen Z and millennials. So the future talent pool really depends on organizations prioritizing DEI. And these organizations, my colleagues, working together to ensure that we, we do it with one voice, with one mission. So uh, I believe that's the best way that we're going to be able to, to, to see change. You know, Ozzy, you're hitting on something very important, just some of the generational differences. Linda, I know that's something that you're very focused on, that there's, there's differences between generations and how they look at DEI and DEI programs. Yeah, I, I definitely. And it's interesting because as we look at just DEI in general, it's been... It's been a focus of so many companies for so long that, in particular, you know, I start to wonder if people are taking for granted the gains that have been made by previous generations that really helped to fight for the kind of equity that we have and the, 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 the advances that we have had. I'm not, you know, saying that we haven't had any advances, but I think when that happens, you have people who start to assume that this is just the norm. And until you actually have something like the Supreme Court decision that is now really creating this sea change and really taking away, I think, some of the, um, I would say, the assumptions of the rights that we had to being able to really uh, ensure that there is opportunity for all, but in equitable ways that underrepresented individuals will have bias-free, but also uh, subjectiveness-free opportunities to really grow. And right now, I think that's what's really happening is that I think you have younger generations, but even, even among generations that are like, you know, the millennials and the, and the Gen Xers too, I think there's this assumption of the problem's been solved and we didn't need it, you know, let's just be meritocracy, you know, let's just create this meritocracy. But, you know, the reality is that this did not happen without the kind of fights that have been happening over the last, I would say, 70, you know, 80 years now. It's kind of weird to say that it's been that long. But I mean, you know, this fight has been ongoing for a long time and it didn't come without a lot of hard work. And to have it dismantled is disturbing. And I think we need to continue to remind everybody, you know, the status quo don't take it for granted. We need to keep pressing forward because we're seeing, and I think we even see it in the numbers now with, with immigration uh, coming uh, to the U.S., that it helps to revitalize our business sector, our economy, and we have to ensure that all people, especially people from communities that are oftentimes underrepresented in business, have those opportunities to thrive and to make our economy stronger. You know, Linda, you're hitting on some generational issues, but you're also focused on some cultural issues in the Asian community, and you want uh, Asian executives and professionals to, to actually lean in more. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I, and I will say that I, I, the Asian American community is a very diverse community, and obviously, you know, we have those who felt very differently given the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action last year. But I also feel like we have many in our community who also believe in the value and the need for DEI and the, the opportunities that they've been given in the workplace because of it. And so, you know, my message is to remind people, you know, don't be so focused on four years of your life trying to get into a college that may or may not necessarily benefit you because the next 40 years of your work career is going to be, I think, uh, really impacted by how much opportunities that DEI gives all of the different individuals in this country, you know, those are opportunities that, again, Asian Americans as well as uh, black Americans, uh, Latinos, women, right. LGBTQ, Native Americans, you know, we've all been fighting for this opportunity to ensure that future generations continue to benefit from, you know, the, the kind of uh, focus on ensuring that we have as much opportunity as anyone else has had um, who is in the majority. So. You know, the, the battle for equity and opportunity, of course, is very multifaceted. We're hitting on generational issues, cultural issues, but there's also political issues. Michael, I'm going to come back to you. How are you navigating the political landscape that we're currently in? Uh, again, that's the Reddit IPO right behind me. I apologize for the noise, but Michael, I want to ask you, 
How are you navigating the political issues when it comes to corporate America? Well, one thing that um, is, is clear that the, the vast majority of Americans expect corporations to reflect the, the demographics of America. Uh, the vast majority of Americans, uh, and I'm by virtue of a Black Economic uh, Alliance uh, a Harris poll recently uh, that was, was communicated, that's, that's the source I'm talking from, you know, expect organizations to make an effort to be effective at being more representative of American uh, demography, uh, dem demographics. So I think the, the, from a corporate perspective, which is the community upon which I spend the majority of our time on the ELC side uh, communicating to, stakeholders expect companies to operate at peak, at peak performance. Diversity, equity, and inclusion does differentiate profitability, employee retention, decision-making, innovation, for organizations who do it well. How to ensure that there are more people representing the vast mosaic of options of types of folks that are available to you are operating at the highest levels they can to contribute at a high levels is our primary purpose as employers. And so independent of the politics, Growing, highly con highly functioning, contributing leaders within organizations to help advance the business interests of companies is, in my apolitical, in my in our opinion, and so focusing on that as the as the direct because you know even if you address in inequities as as I think Ozzy and and Linda was even referencing with the SCOTUS. Uh, decision, you know, college admissions, and uh, was the primary focus around that discussion. It did not address corporate business practices. Corporate business practices relative to equity means fair treatment, fair access to training, fair access to development uh, for people to grow. That's how you do business more effectively. And so we that just stay a business focused case for diversity, Michael. That's you, the business like case right there. Right, you're making the business case for diversity. We've actually heard a lot of notable CEOs make the business case as well. Uh, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon's been one of them. Uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce, Carol Tomei from UPS. I've heard them all make that business case for diversity. So I also yeah. want to ask you, Sid and Ozzy, how do you make that business case for diversity? And also, I want to touch on something that Linda touched on. Uh, the Asian community certainly is not homogenous, neither is the Latino community. You have a lot of people from different countries and coming from different political viewpoints. Well, well, sure, Frank. Well, let me first start by the fact that, um, I mean, I look at myself as an example. I'm a proud Dominican-American. I'm the first Afro-Latino CEO of any national Hispanic organization in U.S. history. Uh, and so this is something that's very dear to me personally as a black man and as a Latino. Um, with all that being said, one thing that's important to understand is that corporate America will always follow the culture case even if it's at the expense of the business case. We have been talking business case for generations, the business case for women as CEOs, and despite that, only 10% of women, Fortune, 5, Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Uh, we've been talking about this from the black and Latino and Asian American side, and despite that, 30% black board directors, 5% Latino and Asian board directors, 55% uh, are still white men. And so when we look at the fact that the dynamics still have not changed, that's because is whenever the business case conflicts with the corporate case, that is when many companies will say, well, let me pull back and let me focus on culture, which is why the backlash on DEI are coming from those who oppose an acculturation of our country as we become multicultural, which is an inevitability. We know that the United States is going to continue to be multicultural, and that's why we always say, Hasser, that it's, we have to learn that corporate America must acculturate to us, 
not ask us to assimilate into an existing uh, structure that has been around for 200 years. But once we understand that, then we can start making that business case when we can start addressing the culture case on boards and in the C-suite in corporate America and in other areas of our society, including universities and foundations and other institutions. Those are the key things we have to do, Fred. All right, so Ozzy, same question for you. How do you make this business case for diversity at the same time balance some of the different political leanings within the Latino community? Well, I think it's going back to the data that uh, we have to listen to. You know, by 2050, more than half of the U.S. workers and consumers will be people of color. And that's a number that none of us can ignore. So if that's not a business case there, then I don't know uh, what is. You know, specifically, when we look at the various uh, homogenous community, as we state with the Latino community, you know, we have to really understand that if we don't get this right now, my children um, will come out into the workforce and look at us either as um, with a lot of self-identity issues and or laugh in our face because at that point, there might it might not matter anymore. So for us, the business case, as Sid has shared, has been shared multiple times. Now, I think the business case needs now to be added with a humanity approach. You know, now more and more, our families are becoming more, quote unquote, non-traditional. And I'm an example of that as a father of seven-year-old twins and married to a wonderful husband. Uh, and through that, you know, we've come to realize that there is different ways to kind of to, to um, identify and also that we want to feel safe in the places that we work. I believe strongly that in a number of years that many um, individuals that are not supporting DEI today are going to because what this is going to do is personally touch them and their family. So I think the humanity piece along with the business case is really going to be very important for us to really connect with those who today are pushing back. All right. So obviously this is an ongoing conversation. I think all of us will have individually and as groups going on throughout the rest of this year and maybe for many years to come. Before we end this conversation today, though, I want to just get final takeaways, final thoughts from each one of you. Um, if there's something actionable coming up that people can do, Linda, I'm going to start with you. Just your final thoughts to try to wrap up this conversation that, of course, we could just keep talking about forever. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. I think I just want to also just remind everybody, you know, there are no blue companies. There are no red companies. Uh, there's one color that really matters, and that's green, uh, even with the culture issues. And I think just looking at the future, it's like many other things. There's there's a pendulum. I think right now we're, we're it's swinging a little bit, you know, to one side. However, I think like what Ozzy and what Sid and Michael have all said, I think we're going to come to a place where, you know, companies currently realize the importance that diversity, equity, inclusion brings. Everybody else, I think, eventually is going to come to that same conclusion. I think the younger generation, even though there has been a status quo, maybe mindset, I think okay. they're going to realize that we're in a sea change kind of environment and they are not going to allow you know, the kind of gains that have been made over the previous generations to completely be decimated. And I think we're going to start to see that there's going to be a place where we're going to come back to everybody valuing, you know, the contributions that all of us who are diverse bring to the workplaces and the companies. You know, Linda, your answer has me thinking, and, and unfortunately, everybody's going to have to answer this quickly along with their final takeaway, but AI, do you think that's going to help diversity efforts? Will it impact diversity efforts in the near term in, in any significant way? I mean, honestly, I, I think AI is a really interesting kind of tool, but I, I, it is definitely going to be uh, one that I think is going to have to be really monitored carefully. And I think that's where all of us as DEI advocates are also watching, too. You know, it, how is it, what's it going to do to all of us? Um, because we're not the ones that are building the AI models. We have to keep this part short and sweet, but Ozzy, I want to come to you very quickly. Your thoughts on AI and diversity efforts and also your final takeaway. A hundred percent, I believe AI is going to be a benefit for DEI, specifically the Latino community. And I say uh, the number one reason why Latinos are least represented in corporate boards and in C-suite is not because there's not enough of us. It's because it's we're a very commu difficult community to source. We don't all have Hispanic surnames, visible physical characteristics, but with AI, we can increase our opportunity to ensure that we're in the pipeline. And then lastly, you know, I think it's time for us to stop discussing if companies are investing in DEI. 
and really highlight and spread the word of those who are bravely moving forward the DI efforts and are succeeding. That's what we need to focus on. So Michael, same question for you. AI and DEI, how do you see the impact and also your final takeaway? Well, I think artificial intelligence, just like any other technological advance, will benefit uh, us more than hurt uh, in general, just by virtue of the efficiencies and access to Ozzy's point that comes with it. The takeaway that I would like, the last point I'd like to make relative to diversity, equity, and inclusion, though, is that, it's that we have to get to a place where we recognize it isn't about one group losing at the expense of another. It's about everybody benefiting both financially, culturally, and, and, and um, personally as a result of us doing this well. Sid, last word. Sure. Um, well, one is AI can be helpful so long as the AI importers are diverse themselves. That's very important when it comes to AI. And then my final words is the fact is, is that we know that we have not achieved Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. We know that uh, we haven't gotten there in terms of uh, what Cesar Chavez has said. So in the words of Dr. King and John Lewis, we shall overcome. In the words of Dolores Suerta, si se puede, we will not let non-diverse individuals tell diverse individuals how to be non-diverse. So we're going to continue to move forward, and we're also looking forward to working with allies, including white men and white women as allies, to make sure that we achieve that true dream of DEI and equality in corporate America.